Welcome to another uh, evening of the After Dark presented by Field of 68. We're supposed to have some pretty good games today and tonight. UConn, Xavier, Cincinnati, Houston, Colorado State, New Mexico. Instead, I'm looking at it. We do have a barn burner, guys. We got a barn burner between Pitt and Notre Dame. Pitt up by one at the Pete with 24 seconds left. We'll keep tabs on that. Uh, but most of the big games and the best games have been scra scrapped. If you've been following my Twitter, um, listen, it's all cancellations right now, which sucks. Um, I'm joined Steve Prohm, Randolph Childress, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about cancellations in the state of college basketball. We're also going to give our midseason awards, our All-American teams, our Coach of the Year, our Player of the Year, our Freshman of the Year. I hope we disagree with, with on some of these guys because I, I don't need to be in agreement with both of you. I want to have some a little bit of a, of a debate uh, on some of these guys. I think there's probably eight, nine, ten guys that you can make a case for uh, for our five men All American teams. But uh, first, guys, how deflating has it been? It's been brutal for me because all I've been doing, like I said, is tweeting out these cancellations. I'm almost at the point now where I feel like maybe we should just take an overall college basketball pause for the next seven to 14 days and, and slow it down so that everybody, or at least more than 50% of every team can test positive. So you won't have these pauses going forward. Steve, what you were in this last year, deep in it, both of you guys were like, what, what do you think right now? What should be done? Well, I think first off, you know, last year you were prepared and scheduled for cancellations, you know, with space for, for opportunities to make up games. Uh, I know the testing procedure, the way it worked last year, you know, once you tested positive, you didn't test again, you know, for several months. Now I'm not in, you know, the thick of it this year, so I don't know all the procedures testing wise, but I know when people tested early, that kind of gave them clear, clear way, you know, for the next couple of weeks or a couple of months without having to be tested. And that was huge. You know, we had a lot of teams you saw throughout the summer uh, get a lot of outbreaks uh, early in the year. We got our outbreak right in the thick of it, kind of January at Kansas. We tested positive uh, one of our kids and that kind of led to a little bit of an outbreak, two, three weeks. And we traveled, we played with six guys for a couple of weeks and, uh, but you look at all over, you know, I saw one of my former guys, Tyrese Halliburton, you know, just tweeted one time, you know, Adrian Orzanowski, he's tweeting like it's trade deadline. You know what I mean? This guy's in protocol. This guy's got COVID. You know, then you look at your tweet. This game's canceled. You know, bowl game. UCLA just canceled their bowl game. Uh, it's all over. And I don't say it caught everybody by go off guard, but nobody saw this coming as intense as this is right now. Uh, college basketball is the best sport there is, you know, it's, you know, it's what I love. It's my passion. And so hopefully we were able to continue to go forward healthy and, and play this season out. Hey Randolph, I, I pulled, I've started pulling a bunch of head coaches, just head coaches right now of what they think we should do. Should we move forward or should we take a seven to 14 day pause? Again, for me, it's almost selfishly because Right now, it just doesn't feel good. The sport just feels like a shit show to me. You're, you're trying to go through it. Mark Emmert's nowhere to be found. I joke that I saw him on, on the beach in San Juan the other day, sun tanning, you know, bathing and, and drinking margaritas. But he may as well have been because he's nowhere to be found right now. He's AWOL and nobody's surprised by it. Two thirds of the coaches that I pulled so far, and I pulled over 50 so far, they say keep going. Keep going. Don't pause uh, and, and kind of fight through this. What do you say? Well, the problem you have if you pause and then right is if you pause, as soon as you start back up, it's going to continue again. Uh, and so I don't think it's going to it's going to save anything. And, and back to what we were talking about before, Steve was saying last year it was pre vaccination and it was before we knew much about it. So now I'm curious as to what, it, what does it mean now when you're vaccinated? But some of it is, you know, like like. I'll go back to a year ago with us, with us and for myself in particular. When I got it, some people get it and they sit there fine, right? Well, I was, I vomited for a week. Um, I couldn't eat or drink for a week. I had a 
yeah, oh yeah, I had uh, fevered, all the symptoms. I lost taste and smell for the rest of the season. I didn't get my taste and smell back until April. Uh, oh. The unfortunate part was I, I gave it to my wife and my daughter and I nearly killed my wife. Like my wife had pneumonia. Sick. Yeah, there were no beds. Uh, put my wife in the hospital, took my wife to the hospital. There were no beds for her. They sent her home. I actually went to a hotel when I got diagnosed. And so uh, without boring you guys with all the details, but the, those are the things that are happening. And I think those are the things that everyone's scared of if something happens to a player. Yeah. That's really what this is about. It, it is we rather slow a game, miss a game, because no one wants to be responsible for anything debilitating or long-term happening to one of their kids. That's just yeah, about as much as we want to play. It's right. just about liability right now. Nobody wants to accept responsibility. There's not one university that's going to do it. That's why Mark Ember can't step up and say anything because just playing devil's advocate to it, if I had to answer it, that's just the reality of it. No one wants to come out and say it, but that's just the facts of it. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, one coach uh, who has been affected by this, actually uh, second year in a row, is Stanford's Jared Haas. And He's going to join us here in a minute to tell us his story. Uh, he's still back right now in Hawaii, three days after four players and a manager were hit with positive test results uh, in Hawaii at the Diamond Head Classic. Wow. A manager and kind of take me through that if you can Jared and what happened that day and why you decided to stay in Hawaii well yeah we had um uh, you know one of our players feeling bad and, and tested and um we followed the our doctors and healthcare care <laughs> uh, recommendations and tested and uh we ended up with multiple positives and uh, decided to shut it down with the concern of sending guys home and sending them all over the country um at that point, what we did is um, there, you know, those those everybody that tested positive uh, needed to stay here. They weren't allowed uh, working with healthcare officials here and our doctors and everything else. So uh, the game was canceled and um, there wasn't really a decision to make. Those guys needed to stay. We did send everybody home the next day uh, to their homes or back to the Bay Area. Um, and at that point, uh, myself and a uh, staff member were, were staying behind. Uh, with them just I mean to be honest with you there's not a whole lot to do besides doing some laundry and picking up food for the guys there's nothing else really to do so it's um, it's as much you know trying to do the right thing and not leaving guys behind uh, I am going to probably head back here soon and then the last day or two they'll be with another staff member and, and we'll get the guys back to the Bay Area soon but uh, literally the the information is changing day by day obviously from the length of quarantines to, to masks to, I mean, let alone uh, PAC 12 or Santa Clara County. I mean, there's a thousand different kind of inputs here and it's been a wild, wild deal. 
Hey, Jared, obviously last year, your, your kids, I mean, were away from campus for an extended amount of time. And then you look at this situation now where all you guys, you know, several guys test, you know, in Honolulu, uh, you know, positive. How have you dealt with that as, as the leader, as the head coach, just going through too difficult because being in the mix of it last year, understanding and Randolph as well, just how difficult managing COVID and, and outbreaks are. How has the last year and a half been for you and how have you kind of really helped yourself and your staff manage your guys? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it is challenging. Last year was last year was super challenging. We were we were away from campus for part of four part or all of four calendar months. Part of November, we left we left for a, a seven or eight day trip for or six day trip to North Carolina for the Maui Invitational last year, and we didn't come back until February. And um, so that was really challenging for our guys. And I never discounted mental health in the past, but I probably didn't understand it. Uh, very well. And I certainly have more to learn, but I can say after last year um, that I saw firsthand uh, a wide range of mental health issues. And it was really hard. I mean, when you just think about all the different things, but one thing is not one time did somebody on my team last year eat with another human being. They'd go pick up their meal, they'd go to their room and they sit by themselves and eat. And so it was, it was really challenging last year. And, and that showed its face in a lot of different ways. In a perfect world, you know, we'll we'll get through this and, and have more normalcy this year. I think we're in an environment now that is more normal. Uh, we'll have some bumps in the road like we have right now, um, but I'm hoping this is more of a short-term problem than a long-term problem for our team. Coach, I wanted to switch it up a little bit and talk to you about just a job. Aside from COVID, uh, being at Stanford, it's a, it's a high academic institution, and I can relate to this going at Wake. With all the changes with the, you know, NILs, and that, that's not an issue but the transfers and everything else. I know that's not the easiest thing in the world to navigate and, and getting players in and out the University of Stanford. How have you navigated that as successfully as you have? Yeah, honestly, this is, uh, this is a topic that's a lot more than a, a 10 second or a 20 second response. Oh, no question. I mean, it'd be a, it'd be yeah, a fascinating- you can go two minutes. And it's, it is a fascinating, fascinating situation. And you guys know the big topics, but being at Stanford, um, you know, we haven't had a transfer since I've been here uh, come in. There have only been a small number of transfer undergrad transfers out in Stanford history. I think it's single digits in 110 years. And so we have who we are going to have. We're going to build it with freshmen. We're going to grow with freshmen. And uh, very rarely will, be, will we have transfers in or out uh, unless they're, they're going to be grad transfers. And then right. grad transfers have transferred in the past. Um, the, the, the gamut of issues around college basketball right now impact everybody, but certainly us. Uh, transfers is one of them. Name, image, likeness is certainly going to be one of them. Um, and with all of it, we just need to roll with the punches. I will say this. I love being at Stanford. I love the idea of selling the idea of a high academic institution. Uh, one thing very rarely right now do you hear people talk about the value of an education, and that really bothers me. And I'm all for you know name, image, likeness. I'm all for um, giving student athletes uh, the ability to make choices. All these things are, are great. But one thing that we always, you never hear about the value of the education, uh, just that, um, you know, the student athletes aren't getting a good experience. And I, I know when I was a, a, a player, I had a wonderful experience. I really did. And I thought there was so much value to that. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, and moving forward, I just think the reality is, and this isn't meant to say it's good or bad, life as we know it is over in terms of college athletics. And I think we're, I don't think it's going to be 10 years from now where it's vastly different. I mean, this, this profession, this job just in the last year or two has completely flipped on its head. And again, I don't say that as a bad thing. I say it as it's a major, major change and it's going to be an interesting time for everybody, but especially at Stanford because our set of circumstances is different. And honestly, there's a lot of positives with that as well, because there aren't going to be very many programs in the country that truly uh, have a culture that can talk about culture that can talk about developing players. I mean, the number of transfers, as we all know, is incredible, right? But we can talk about, you're going to come here. I, I joke with recruits and I say, if you come here, you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you. So we better get it right. And with that, the player development piece for us is huge. And uh, again, we're unique. We're a complete outlier in all of this, but I really love being here and I love selling what we, what we're selling. Well, you got a great freshman again. I mean, you had one last year, Zaire Williams, who I think had his challenges, right? Because you guys had your challenges. 
being off campus, he certainly had had a rough time early. Harrison Ingram, 6'8", from Texas, having a great start to his college career, averaging about 12 and 7. And you look around the country, there's not a lot of freshmen making the same level of impact that Harrison Ingram is so far this year. Uh, describe to me kind of what he's been able to do and why he's been able to get caught up so quickly as a freshman this year. Well, a couple of things. Number one, he's physically ready. And most freshmen aren't physically ready on day one. Um, and so that's just a credit to him and uh, his DNA and his parents, I suppose, to a certain extent. But he's worked hard to get to this point. The other thing is he's just a winner and he's, he's, um, uh, he has a great feel for the game and great understanding of the game. And, and the game comes easy to him in some ways. He, it's, the game is slow for him. And I say that in a positive way, yeah. that he can see things that most freshmen you know, can't see. I mean, if you look at all the McDonald's all, America, all, McDonald's all Americans in the country, you know, very few are really having a huge impact. And I had a coach tell me recently um, that his recommendation to a top, uh, you know, 20 to 70 type kid is you should go to a mid-major if you want to play right away and then transfer to a high major at that point. But very few freshmen are ready to compete at this level. And Harrison was one of the very, very few that is. Hey, Jared, <clears throat> the Cal game coming up. Any word kind of where you sit with that game? I know you said you may be leaving here in the next day or two. Today's the 28th. I believe you play uh, this weekend, some point second. Um, any news right now in the Cal game uh, or where you guys sit with that game going forward? Uh, nothing definitive yet. I'm hoping we can get um, solutions that soon. We have had uh, more positive tests within the program, and guys are kind of all over the country. Um, you know, as you can imagine, not only do you have NCAA rules, uh, Pac-12 rules, national rules in terms of quarantines, um, but we're also going to have Stanford rules and Santa Clara County rules. And so um, not everybody's in line yet in terms of the length of the quarantines. And so there's a lot more questions than answers right now. Uh, but I hope for everybody's sake we can uh, you know, get a resolution and a decision um, just so that, again, peace of mind for everybody. And, um, but I don't know definitively uh, with that game right now. Coach, we got a mutual friend, and you got to give me a story on him. Steve Woodbury. I know you guys go way back. You got to give me a story in the locker room. How was Steve in the locker room and the team? Steve's matured over the years. He was he – was, uh, <laughs> so he was a senior uh, my redshirt year when I transferred from Cal. And Steve and I are close to this day. But, uh, uh, I mean, he was so tough on the young guys. And he was always nice to me, and I don't know why, but he was always nice to me. But, um, you know, he was he, he's, he didn't mess around a whole lot. And he, he let the young guys know whose locker room it was and who was in charge. But, um, you know, this is a, a public show, so I'm not going to be able to give you too many specific um, good uh, stories there. But uh, he's fantastic and, uh, and, and been really, uh, yeah, really successful in everything he's done. He speaks very highly of you. <laughs> so, Jared, how, how long did your family come with you to Hawaii or – was it a few day trip and you said, Hey, I'll be home. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking a red eye or whatever. I'll be home the day after Christmas. Yeah. So no, they came with me, which was really cool. Um, had a great trip with them. Um, we left all the Christmas presents at, um, at home. And so the kids were excited to get back. And so they left on the 26th, first thing on the 26th. And uh, I'll be honest with you right now. It's uh, they keep asking when I'm going to be home because all the presents are still there and they're waiting for me. So <laughs> So I have good kids and a good wife that are, uh, are, are making the, the presents wait till I get there. Cause I told them, look, if you guys really need to do it, I'll, I'll get on zoom and we can do it that way. Um, but I have really good kids and they're, they're, they're chomping at the bit to open those presents. Do you, do you think your players, I tweeted this earlier because I'd heard it from a program that, you know, the, the new CDC guidelines are uh, five days now in, in isolation and you can come out and six to 10, you have to wear a mask. I tweeted out and people, I think, thought I was either crazy or just the, the blowback. I said, you're going to see some players potentially wearing masks playing in games here because they want to get back quickly. But again, on day six, seven, eight, nine, um, you're supposed to wear a mask per the CDC guidelines. Have you heard anything about that with you guys so not, when you come I back? Not heard anything. A great conversation. I think uh, the reality is my kids in, in our county um, – you know, freshman in high school and sixth graders playing AU and everything. And they've been, you know, for this last year, 
once they got on the court, they have been wearing masks on the court. Yeah. And I think, um, I think there's probably a certain level of how serious is the County, you know, how much will the pushback back be if you don't wear masks? Um, but I agree with you. I think that's very real and, and a real possibility. And I think it's the kind of thing in certain situations that people uh, try and bend the rules or apply rules differently. There, there could be some pushback and some consequences of that. Yeah, no, I, I think there's going to be, I mean, again, I, I asked both these guys and I think, um, you guys are in agreement. Stephen Randolph, push forward with this and don't pause college basketball right now. The, the only reason why I think it might be the way to go is because right now it, it looks like a little bit of a circus with so many games being canceled. And I think if you shut it down for 10 days per se, let's say you shut it down for 10 days, I think you would have a lot of teams in those 10 days. You already have a bunch that have had seven, eight guys get COVID and without symptoms necessarily. And then you'd be able to move on. And so many teams would have at least seven players available for the rest of the year. And you could, these two games you're going to miss, which hopefully it's only like two, three games. You could make up a couple of them along the way. You might miss a game or two in conference play, but for the most part, it could be smooth sailing after the next 10, 14 days for most teams. Yeah, I mean, it's a sound argument. And obviously, there's a there's a counter argument to it in the whole bit. But it's it, it is a sound argument. And, uh, you know, and the testing piece is interesting, too, because not everybody's testing aggressively and consistently. And so if you if in that situation, my guess is everybody say, well, let's test everybody right now and let's get everybody into this, this shutdown and then we can move on. And so that would encourage testing in that scenario. Yeah, there are about 40. I pulled yesterday 125 schools and about 42% only said they're, they're testing their whole team coming back from Christmas break. And yeah. Steve, the whole big 12, by the way, none of them are testing coming back from Christmas break. Just so you know, <laughs> your, your, your big 12, your, your, your Midwest is uh, uh, a little bit different than the rest. Well, no, you, you're also an Alabama guy. So you got the Midwest and you got Alabama and, and, and the SEC. In the Northeast up here, it's so funny how different it is, though, geographically, because the Northeast is like probably 80 percent of those teams tested the entire team when they came back. And obviously the Ivy League is like, you know, 100 uh, percent. Hey, Jared, does the Pac-12, is there a couple of definitive rules with the COVID testing uh, team games cancellations for I know that there's been a, th a lot of ch change with that over the last couple of weeks, but does the Pac-12 have a couple uniform things with the testing procedures well a variety of things in terms of uh you know having after guys are through quarantine you need to uh, have guys practice for a couple days uh, if you're below the seven but seven players one coach and you're able to play um i don't think there's uniform testing right now i think that's more institution based um and uh there will be some variety there about how you do things obviously uh, the normal CDC guidelines if your symptoms and uh, I think everybody's testing in that scenario, but it's more the the games and how how the games are played and you know the seven seven scholarship players, one coach, then it's the green light to play. Coach, how did you handle the vaccination? Was it mandatory? Did you mandate it, or you, how did you man how did you manage the the vaccination part of the, of your uh, your program? Yeah, great question. I would say encouraged and and educated the guys. Um, certainly didn't mandate it. We are hundred percent vaccinated for everybody within our program. Um, but it wasn't, it was never a mandate from me. Now, having said that the university, um, has had some mandates and, and, uh, even with boosters coming up. And so our guys would fall into that category, uh, based on the university guidelines. All right. Well, listen, Jared, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, good luck getting home. Good luck to your kids. Uh, yeah, you get them gifts. So and finally, and finally Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. Go celebrate Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy holidays. Hopefully you get on the court uh, soon, hopefully for your kids as well. Uh, you guys get back on the court soon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it. You got it.
Mitchell go pro? Do you lose some of those guys? You'll never know. We didn't finish that year. But what he's done and the way they've done it, and because they, if you if you followed them, he's totally changed how they defend now. The zone is gone. I mean, you go on, yes. to, you go on to uh, Synergy and you chart their possessions. I mean, he doesn't play the one one three zone that when I first got to the Big Twelve, that's all everybody talked about. How are you going to go against Baylor zone? And then Scott will throw in a little triangle and two, and kind of about that seven eight minute mark of the second half when he needs to kind of steal some possessions. Um, the, the reload this year and what they've been able to do and the teams they've beat, you know, those guys can play it all for midseason coach of the year this weekend. Uh, but credit to both of those guys on the job that they've done. How about Calvin? I mean, Kevin Sampson as well. I mean, you're talking about yeah. 10 and two and, yeah. you know, with a, 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 a close game losing to Alabama, they were a, a tip from being, you know, 11 and one. So, I think he'd be right there. I throw him in my top five as well. And they're they're in trouble going forward now. They oh, they, yeah, they're arguably yeah. their their they're best done. two offensive players in, in in Mark and Sasser. Yeah, but I don't because know, of the if, way because of the way they compete though, and yeah. because of who Kelvin Sampson is, yes, they will never be an easy out. They will not be an easy <laughs> the out. The toughness though. not going anywhere. Yeah, they ain't going, going that. If but I might pick him to win the league. You know, he may throw Qantas White and Hollis Price out there. I mean. They, <laughs> I mean you know, they are going yes. to compete yeah. still. Yes. And yes. so, I mean, this the, the, the losses obviously are huge. Kelvin over the long haul has just done a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And what he's done there is remarkable. All right. I, I'm, we'll go freshman of the year next. Freshman mm -hmm. of the year. Uh, I'll start this one. I, I'm going – it's not easy, okay? Apollo Mancara has had a hell of a year. I'm going Jabari Smith from Auburn over, over Ben Caro. I just feel like he's made a huge impact on his team. He's out there every minute. Um, you know, Paulo's had his issues with cramping up and not playing full games. He's been terrific too, but uh, Jabari Smith to me is my freshman of the year. Yeah, I don't, I, I'll jump in there next. And I, and I had two down and I, and I figured you guys would say, you know, uh, you know, Paulo, you know, uh, and so I had down, you know, Jabari Smith. I, I was actually in Murray yesterday and I bumped into, uh, Matt McMahon and yep. they just played Auburn. And I said, man, how good is Auburn? And he said, man, they're good. He goes, let me tell you, Jabari Smith. And he went on for a little bit. And so then I went and kind of punched the numbers and looked and, you know, so I, I had Jabari Smith down as well. Let's make it a threesome. I had Jabari. I, I, I think he's the other guys. I mean, it was a three, three man race all along. I mean, between Chet and Paulo and, and, and Jabari, I, I think the other two have better surrounding cast of players around him that they can rely on a bit. I think he is, I knew he was good. I didn't know he was this good. I mean, he's scoring it on all three levels, shooting it over 40, nearly 45 from three. I mean, he has been – he's been – I think he's been the top freshman. Yeah. All right, we're, we'll do our All-American teams next and then pick our player of the year. Had a little bit of intrigue here. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'll start with one, and, and you guys tell me if you don't have him on, okay. on your All-American teams. How's that? And we'll kind of go around the room here. We'll, we'll, we'll alternate. To me, this is the guy that if you don't have him on your All-American team, I, I might leave right now. E.J. Liddell from Ohio State. I think he's got to be on it. He has made an incredible impact for Ohio State. They beat Duke. They're in the top 20, and they're doing it really without a point guard. And E.J. Liddell offensively has been terrific, but the biggest difference in his game from last year to this year has come in the defensive end. He yeah. can guard multiple positions. He's blocking like three shots a game. I mean, like he's done everything. Yeah, he can change shots at the rim as well. I, you know, it's kind of like you said off off air. I've probably got eight or nine down, uh, <laughs> and I've got a I've got heavy front court guys. Yeah, kind of big wings, fours yep. and fives, and I do just point guard. But I kind of do it by position. Am I up next to throw my guy out there? Is that go ahead? Right? Are you go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ochai Baji. Yeah, Ochai. Got to be on it. Yeah, got to be on, on there. Yep. Uh, I love him. I just think. He, what he's been able to do, and the funny thing is, they're redshirting his freshman year, uh, and about halfway through the year, Coach Sell's like, "Hey, we probably need this guy." And then it's like, "This guy's a lot better than we all thought." 
And now he's probably put himself by coming back to school, yeah. you know, in a position to be a first round pick. Uh, his efficiency and ability to shoot and size and competitiveness and toughness and winning traits. He's been phenomenal for them. All right. That's so a, hold on. Let, let's, let's kind of, let's regroup here. Uh, Randolph, <laughs> did you, both you guys had EJ Liddell? Yes. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. I had Ochai. I had Ochai on there as well. I had Ochai. Yep. All right, so you're up now. We, we right, agree. I, I'm, I'm throwing the monkey wrench in here. I'm going uh, with Wendell Moore from Duke. I, 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 I think Paulo's been uh, the, with maybe you. the most hyped player. I think Wendell Moore, and, I, I, you know, I've been saying to Jeff, you know this already, I, I think he's been their best player. I think he's been their most consistent player. I think he's the guy that they go to. I think he's the leader of the team. I mean, he's 17, 5, and 5 for those guys, yep. shooting at 58% from the floor. I, I think Wendell Moore is definitely a first-team All-American. Steve, I didn't have him, and now I'm mad at myself. I didn't have him down. Because, uh, you know, I probably, you know, you just think Duke right away. You're going through it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but um, I think this guy's got to be on it between from this going forward outside of Wendell Moore is big Kofi at Illinois. I just think with the loss of Curbelo uh, right now, other guys have really had to step up. And when you have such a dominant post presence, that can do it on both ends of the, of the floor, scoring, dribble handoffs, protecting the rim, rebounding the basketball. It makes everybody's better. It makes your guards better. It makes the game easier for everybody when you have that rim protection and then you have somebody that can have protect, uh, be a presence in the pain. And so, and especially in Illinois, playing great right now. I mean, they're, they're really coming on right now. Since they left Kansas City, they've been terrific. Yeah. And so I, I, I've got Kofi down there. So I have Wendell on there. I do not have Kofi. And Illinois fans are going to kill me for this because Illinois fans are out of their <laughs> minds. And I get it. Like, like you said, there's seven, eight, maybe nine guys that I think you can put in the equation here. Kofi, for me, was number six. All right, so I got Liddell. I got Ochai. I got Wendell Moore. I'm going to throw Johnny Davis on there. Because I think Wisconsin isn't very good without Johnny Davis. I think you take him off Wisconsin. And they're an NIT team. If that, they might not even be an NIT team. He's been that valuable to that team. I think you got to have him on the list this year at this point. Now we'll see if he continues. And it really, to me, depends on if they continue. But they're a top, for me, 15 team in the country right now. And it's almost all because of Johnny Davis. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have Johnny down, but him and Wendell Moore – those that would complete my 10 if I if I finished that 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 out. Did you have Randolph? Randolph didn't have him either, right? I, I, I didn't have him my five, but I had him in my my ten. my eight to nine guys. Okay. He he he's in the group. I I'm That's a big fair. fan of his. He's, he's, I think it's and, tough. And honestly, he, he's right there. I the question I have is where where are they gonna finish? And, and and I think more so of will he get the attention because of where they're gonna finish? Is he all is he worthy? Absolutely. I just wonder if where they're going to finish will affect. But for me, it's where they are now. For me, Absolutely. it's not. No, no, I agree. I agree. You know? he, he deserved it. Very much so. I, very much so. All right. I, so who who do we I, have on that, that we haven't mentioned so far, Randolph? Who do you got? I still got a couple of more guys. I, I, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to – I'll say this. I am – I'm going to go with Drew Timmy. And I, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this. I think okay. – it, he's the one guy, if you take off that team, I think they're not the same. I think with Chet, they're just, he just adds the extra dimension to him that puts them over the top. But I just think Drew has been solid enough that, that if you take him off that team, he's still averaging over 17 a game, six rebounds a game. I, I, I think he is, he's shown up in the big games that they had so far this year. I mean, it's tougher sometimes. Teams are doubling those guys inside and the guards are going to get off against lesser opponents. But when it's mattered, He's been there, and they're not a, a, a national championship Final Four caliber team without him. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think he's in your top ten. To me, right. he's in the back half of it at right. this point. Um, but but he he's there. Uh, all right, who else? Again, uh, mine is EJ Ochai, Wendell Moore, Johnny Davis, Jabari Smith. Yeah. That's my five. Six for me was Kofi. 
Seven for me, Oscar Shibwe. Yeah, I had Oscar in my top top eight right here. You know, more in Johnny Davis, I'd throw them in there as a top 10 in my group now that you guys threw them out there. I kind of did it by, you know, hey, point guard, wings, guard wings, and then good luck and finding so, a point guard. Good well, luck. I just exactly. That was the toughest spot yeah. to find. Yep. But if you're number one in the country and Rob Dowster, if he's watching, which which I'm sure he is, yes. and James Akinjo yep. should be there. I mean, yeah. He's the point guard of the best team in the country right now, yep. today. And his numbers are terrific. It's not 20 points or, you know, it's it's double-figure scoring, good assist-to-turnover ratio, and his team wins, and he is fit in, and he has done what Scott Drew and that staff wants him to do. And so my, my group was Akinjo, Ivy, Igbaji, Liddell, and Kofi. And then I had Timmy, Jabari, Oscar, kind of floating around there, six, seven, eight. I got to throw this out there because I'm the only one that seems like to have this in this list. We all, we all got the same group. The only name that I added or, or group that I had it, I had it split. I think that's why James didn't get it because Baylor, I think it split. You split the votes when you start looking at their team. What CJ, all those guys, was Purdue looking at Williams and Ivy. Like if you look at I, what I those what guys do. Yeah. Say again? I don't know what to do. With I don't know what to do with it. That's what I'm saying. I, I I didn't know how to kind of vote. I, I literally put them as like one person. It's like I want to combine them. <laughs> it's like I want to combine them and say they're one. And they'll cost each other votes to get the award because they're invaluable to the team. And But at the, at the rate they're going, and I they are legitimate Final Four National Championship team. And I, I think those two guys are right there. And, and Williams coming off the bench, his unselfishness to come off the bench. And, but when it matters, he's there. He's going to play. If you were to prorate his numbers over 40 minutes, my goodness, he, he would be player of the year. Yeah. Uh, and Jay and Ivy has been, I mean, I, I just think they're like one. They, they're going to split votes. They're, I put them in as one, but it's two, two players. Those are the only other ones we hadn't mentioned yet. Everyone else we mentioned, but that would be the only group or tandem I'd put in. Yeah, there's a terrific group of those, you know, skill forwards, big forwards, you know, small yep. ball fives, but five, man, whatever you want to call it. It's but, you know, we're not talking about a ton of guards right here. We're talking about big wings and we're talking about forwards and slash, you know, centers, you know, Oscar Sheboy and guys like that. And this is why, guys, I feel like the point guard position is going to mean more this year than ever yes. because there aren't a lot of great ones. No. A lot of teams have really questionable point guard situations. And listen, people get tired of probably hearing me talk about on every show. I say it like I'm starting with a point guard. And if you don't have a really good one, you can't win six straight games. You can't win it. And I'm not even sure you can get there. Now, this year might be a little bit different because it's hard to find really good point guards on a lot of teams right now. I think you're going to see some guys emerge in conference play and really kind of separate themselves or elevate themselves from something that we weren't sure they, they, they like Wendell Moore has been a really good point guard. Yes. For Duke. We didn't yes. think we'd say that, right? I thought it was going to be Jeremy Roach that everything was going to be dependent on. And it's not because Moore has stepped forward and kind of taken that role. And that's why I think Duke has a chance to now win it all. I, yes. Paolo, I knew was Paolo. We weren't worried about him. We were worried about Jeremy Roach in the point guard play, and that is no longer an issue because Wendell Moore has stepped forward. Yeah, I, I think point guard play is is critical, but I think point guard play sometimes people you know misconstrue it as I'm the guy who's dribbling the ball up the floor sometimes and calling two, two, two. Right. I think point guard play is instincts, is skill. Can you make people better? Um, you know what I mean? Can you can you take from the bench to the floor and lead your group, assist to turnover ratio, making people better. I think that's what really goes into point guard play. And that's why you see a guy like Wendell Moore kind of developing into that, that role to where we may have not saw him as a traditional, hey, I'm going to walk it up and call call three. No, I'm going to make decisions. He leads Duke teams in, in assists, I believe. Yes. You know, he's got a great assist to turnover ratio. He can make plays. He makes people better. And he makes winning plays. And uh, you know, we were just talking, that's going to be a great, a great show, you know, Kenjo Hunter, 
Uh, those will be terrific two guards going at each other. You know, this weekend in that game, we touched on, you know, Iowa State Baylor. Hey, Randolph, how, how has the point guard position changed? I mean, I know it's changed, but speak to how it's changed since you played. Wow. Um, I mean, you got to really understand coming from the ACC at that time. I mean, when I got in, it was Bobby Hurley, Kenny Anderson, Chris Corchion. I mean, you just sat and you paid your dues uh, uh, when you when you got into this league and you took your lump, so to speak. I, I think now what's happened to a lot of these guys is the way you were taught to play the game back then and the way these games are watching NBA guys play now. I think they're mimicking NBA guys that the way they're playing in that style. And I just don't think they're, they're the traditional point guard. I don't think they're valuing running the team, the extension of these guys want buckets. Now they want to get the ball. They want to shoot. They want to push. And, and, and I don't know if every, I, I don't know when there's been a time right now where we're sitting here. I can't name off the top of my head that I can say, hey, I want these five point guards. Where, where I, if I had to list the, the top point guards in the country right now, I'd struggle. It's hard. I'd really struggle. I, I'd really struggle with that list. And, and, and guys like Wendell Moore, who's not, he's more of a ball handler and evolved into that role than he's been a traditional traditional point guard. And that's why, like Steve said, a Kinjo. Yeah, is so important because he's got experience. He can make people better. He can score. He's tough. He'll guard. And he's just kind of fit into Baylor. He hasn't tried to be more than Scott Drew needs him to be. He's just right. kind of, you know, he's he's put in there and, and whatever that kind of that fit that he needed, they needed. He's just kind of plugged right into it. And I, I don't know how many guys there are like that around the country yet. We've seen a lot of these transfers. And I talked to Chris Beard yesterday, and, and and he said, we're getting a lot better. And I said, well, that's, you know, listen, you probably are. I said, I, I wouldn't know because you played two games against real teams. So other than that, you played a bunch of cupcakes. So I, I don't know. I'm not watching you. But, you know, Marcus Carr, tell me. He said, no, no, Marcus Carr is getting better, no doubt. Like, we've got Dylan Dissou now who, who was hurt at the beginning of the year. So, you know, I think a lot of these teams, even though – we're not paying attention to them. And you guys can speak to this when you're playing these cupcakes and these buy games. And, and I look at it differently than you guys do. I'm not watching them, but you're watching some of these guys gain confidence, get reps, putting them in positions that if you're playing a big 12 game or an ACC game, they may not be getting those reps or getting that confidence. Right. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I think that's huge. When, you know, with those games, you got kids getting better. You're able to go deeper into your bench if you need to get guys reps, some younger guys, you know, to where you can't put it. You know, if it's, you know, Duke and Carolina or early a Wake Forest and NC State, you're not you're not putting those guys in or it's just hard to do that. And so that's why they probably are getting better, especially the way they want to play. Uh, it just takes time. But when you have opportunities to learn through the games, through winning, your conference is going to grow. And then when you come into conference, I know some teams have started conference play already, but then you come into conference, you get a home game early, or you may have the first two at home and you've got this confidence. Now you win those first two home games. Now you're ready to go on the road and play a legit team because you're confident. You got to swagger about yourself. I wonder about how much COVID is, is going to play a factor in that as well, because you're talking about guys missing a week or missing two weeks. I mean, with any sense, we don't know how much time these guys are going to miss, and then we're missing these games. So now we can't – it's like anything else. You can't simulate the game. So now with all these cancellations and postponements, so now it's going weeks without playing. You're coming off Christmas break. Uh, uh, you know, I, I wonder – how much of this that will affect some of these guys playing? Because now you, you you're missing games, times that you had to come out and play to and practice, to get, you know, get get to practice to get a custom conditioning. All those things matter in the sense of getting over the hump for some of a lot of these transfers, a lot of this movement that we've seen. I, you know, I wonder how much everything that they're going through is hindering that right now. Yeah, the good thing is that hopefully now with the, the CDC changing it to, to five days, right. guys won't be out as long. And while they're out, I think the biggest difference from a year ago, and you guys can speak to this, is, you know, you had guys that couldn't do anything, right? Like certain teams were literally locked in their rooms and couldn't right. leave. I don't know if either one of you 
were, were to that degree. But I was talking to kids that literally could not leave their room. Couldn't they're like, you know, I don't know, jumping rope in their room. And that's yeah. the best they could do. Now they're getting individual work. They mean that and the guys that are, are not testing positive are able to go out. And even if there's five of them, they're able to do stuff on the court every day. They're not completely out of shape. And the ones who did test positive, let's face it, a lot of them don't really have the symptoms that they might have had a year ago. Will they eliminate the fans before they stop playing the games? To do, you know, what, what, what will they do to try to help it to get the season going? Because when you started, when you watch football, they packed those arenas. And now basketball season coming, you're packing your arenas again. So will you, to, to salvage the season, so to speak, or to help alleviate some of the suspensions or postponements and cancellations, will you cut down on your fans? And I, I doubt I don't think they will. I don't think they will either. So that's why I said you're just going to kind of go through it now and just figure it out. Yeah, and I think you, you talk about basketball, that you, when you look at playing indoors, playing in small arenas, playing during the winter stretches, you're going, you're put, you're, you're at, you're obviously going to be a little bit more risk, but I think they've got to push forward. I don't think you, the, the break, I don't know, like Randolph touched on earlier, it's just, it's going to hit again two or three weeks later. So I don't know what the, the break will, will do, uh, but the, the, the cancellations were just, you know, like the UCLA football game tonight. I mean, you find out 45 minutes, <laughs> You know uh, about that. That's that's unbelievable. And these games are dropping like crazy right now. And so, you know, hopefully everybody can. You know, like you said, if it's getting tested, you're positive. You go through that two weeks, and now we kind of we kind of slow down with all the negative. You know, with all the postponements. I wonder too, guys. And I've talked to a lot of coaches over the last couple of days, and you know, so many of them are like skeptical of some of these other teams and coaches, right? Like, well, do they really? not have seven guys right now or are they playing this game that they don't right that they just don't want to play they're losing maybe their top two start you know two of their three starters or something you know i believe it's the same thing that's happening in football I, i'll say this i don't believe all these teams have COVID. i think some of them have losing players to transfers they've been playing all year with a starting quarterback that starting quarterback decides to leave you're like wait a minute i think it's the same thing that's happening in basketball if my two best players, I would rather have the game canceled or postponed than to play a game without my best players knowing that I have a, a heck of a chance that I'm going to lose the game. That's really what's happening. As much as we want to say about the COVID, it's that if the if my best players are not playing, or I don't, you know, then then I'm not playing the game. I, I, there's no way it's going to be old if you got seven and I got my sixth through eighth guy and three walk-ons and two walk-ons. Or whatever, and two walk-ons. I'm not playing. There's not a coach in the country that's going that's going to play. You're just going to cancel the game, and I think that's what's happening, right, wrong, or indifferent. You're yeah. just not going to find a coach that's going to be willing to go out there and say, like Steve, like you said last year, you played with six players. Notre Dame does it because they do it anyway. Other than that, <laughs> no one else is no one else is doing that. They're like, you know what? The heck with that. If I got to play with six guys, I'm probably going to lose. I don't. I'm not going with a walk on off the bench. That's it. Well, I, I talked to a head, I talked to a high major coach a couple of hours ago, and, and he told me he said, "Listen, if it comes down to it in league play, and I got three starters out, no way, I'm, I'm forfeiting. He, they can do whatever they want to me. The, the conference can do whatever the heck they want, but you know what the NCAA is not going to do? They're not going to penalize me for a forfeit. I can still get into the NCAA tournament. It might hurt me in the league. And what's the pen? What are, what have these leagues said?" They haven't come out with any. Is there a financial penalty? Are they going to fine us a million dollars? Who knows? Jeff, how many coaches are on the fence with their jobs? So why play a game and get the L on their record? Like, like, like that's the other part of it. Like, why, why play the game? And that L is going to count. That postponement, that cancellation doesn't count. So that's the other part of it. If I'm going into this year with, with, with a lot of pressure in a heat to win games, I'm not taking any chances. And that's just – the nature of the business. Yeah. I mean, you even think about, you know, look at Michigan football and the phenomenal job Jim Harbaugh did there. You know, last right. year, they were two and four. They had a lot of COVID issues and they just shut it down. And a year later, you know, he brings a terrific team back and he has a, you know, and they have a phenomenal year, you know what I mean? But all the, you know what I mean? All the, the negativity kind of goes away and you know, they get focused and, you know, but battling through the COVID and all the different things is, it is a tough, tough deal when you start having all those different issues. What, what's your guys' 
another poll I'm doing with coaches while I'm polling them on, on whether or not they think we should battle through is what is from, from one to 10, what is your confidence level on NCAA president Mark Emmer? Mine is a zero. Mine's a zero. Up from one <laughs> to 10, I got zero. What do you guys got? I see. <laughs> oh boy, Jeff, this is a tough one. Um, you know, he's got, he's got a, you know, I think the biggest thing is if they can get a unified plan from a standpoint of this is how it is, you know, and this is get say, give him a seven. So if you need a number, but we need a unified plan from conference to conference. So everybody knows what yes. we're dealing with and that would help a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, the bottom line too is just make Dan Gavitt the commissioner of college. Don't just make him in charge of, of the tournaments and he's in charge of all the, the championships. Make him in charge of basketball and give him the autonomy because he knows a lot of people within the sport, whether it's coaches and you guys know this, whether it's media people, and I can attest to that. Uh, he's well liked, he knows what he's doing. Obviously, he's got great bloodlines. Um, and, and I think he's a guy, if given the proper resources and support, he could make a difference. But again, I just don't think he's given that. I think he's given that within the NCAA tournament. And there are certain things, let's face it, that the NCAA can't do. They don't have jurisdiction on certain things. But, you know, like I said the other day, something as simple as the minimum amount of players – like, to me, it should be seven scholarship players. You should not be allowed to play without seven scholarship players. That should be the minimum. Well, why isn't that across all leagues? How difficult is that one? I get testing is different, like Jared Haas was saying, county to county, school to school, conference yeah, to conference. There's a lot of things with that I understand. It's much more difficult. But for minimum players, come on. This should be a layup. That's the softball. That, that's the easy yes. one. This, there's a lot of things out there that everyone understands. I think that's where, you know, Emmerich, there's a disconnect with him and everyone else in understanding what's going on because the simple things that you can say or do are not, I just don't seem to be simple. Well, it's a good old boy network is what that is, and that's what keeps him employed. All the presidents of the schools, he was a school president. They all keep him employed, keep the paycheck coming. And we don't even see anything from him. And that, that's, that's my biggest, honestly, that's my biggest frustration is get front and center. Be, be a leader. Try to have some leadership right now within the sport. The sport right now is in shambles. I, I don't care what anybody says. It's in shambles today. I'm talking about right now in this season where nobody knows what's going on. You, you again, had 30 games today. We we're down at you know 10 or 12 or whatever it was. Tomorrow there's a good slate. We'll talk about this for the last couple of minutes before we uh we sign off. But you know, LSU Auburn tomorrow. I'm gonna be at Seton Hall Providence. I can't wait. Two top 25 teams. I'm I'm just doing this, guys. As I drive <laughs> in the in the morning, I'm gonna I'm gonna have I hopefully coffee with Kevin Willard in the morning tomorrow. And I'm just gonna do this the whole way there. It's like, please let there let there be a game. I mean, Tennessee, Alabama. Tomorrow night, we've already lost Duke Clemson, Temple Villanova. Those are two two good games that are gone. We're going to lose 10 more tomorrow. I'm telling you, we're going to lose 10 more. But, you know, again, I guess what you guys are saying is just push on and hope we get through it and hope it gets better in the next couple of weeks. I just want to get enough games played it, like it was a year ago. You'll pick a tournament team, and that's all, the, that's all they're worried about. Yeah. That's, That's all really they care all about. about. All they're worried the about tournament. is getting to the tournament, making this money. Whatever 68 teams make it, they make it. We can talk about it. We can talk to the cows come home about who gets in, who does the strength of schedule. What are we going to do with the cancellations, the postponements? Because the problem is, as we talk about all these cancellations and postponements, when are you going to make them up? Because when the season of conference comes around, you're playing every Saturday and or Sunday, every Tuesday and or Wednesday. Like, like, when are you going to mix this up? Are you going to start having games four days a week? Like, you're not going to be able to do it. So so once conference play, there, there's a built-in buy that was already there. Everyone had one. Other than that, that that's long gone. Everyone's well, already You know what you can do? 
here, here's the only my only thought on this, and I don't know with the smaller leagues, with the bigger leagues, like you said, everybody's got to buy in there. With the smaller leagues, can they push back the conference tournament a week and 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 figure out? I know the TV, they got the championship on TV. I get it, people book their their rooms and all that stuff, but if they want the full slate, if they want the full conference slate, that's a way to do it. You'll get two more two more games in easy that way. But again, we already answered that because they tried to do that a year ago and they don't care. They want March Madness when they want it and it yeah. falls into that same schedule. They're not changing it. That date's locked. Everything between now and that Selection Sunday is up for grabs. That's a coin toss. But you best believe Selection Sunday is going to happen and that tournament's going to start right after that. That's for certain. Whoever you, whatever happens, games that are played prior to that, we won't know. But we'll, that tournament will start when it's supposed to start. All right. Before we sign off, you know, we never did. We never picked really? our player of the year. Yeah. We never. All right. So let, let's do it, boys. Let's do it. I mean, it's not easy. That That's actually the most difficult decision I think I've had on this show. And that's probably why I've avoided it till uh, 1059. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to let you guys go first. Steve, start us off. Who's your player of the year? Uh, I'm going to stay in the Big 12. I'm going to go with Ochag Baji. Uh, I just think he's come out of the gates terrific i think he's so efficient uh really under control can really make shots good size obviously we know what bill self in kansas is all about uh, i'm gonna go with baji randolph he was my one and my one i'm going to wonder more i'm going to go with more I, I just think for what he's done i think he's the most consistent player on that team i think he's deserving of it i'm going to go wonder more and i'm going to make it ej liddell so <laughs> three different I just feel like he's done the most with probably the least of those three. And again, I can agree without a point guard. I can agree. You guys know how hard that is to do. They didn't have a point guard to start the season. And then it was going to be just suing and he's been hurt. So EJ Liddell on both ends of the court, I think has been terrific. Keeping Ohio state in the top 25 has been a mammoth task for him. So, all right, listen, guys, I uh, appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, thanks to Steve Prohm, Randolph Childress. Thanks for joining us tonight. Field the 68 after dark. Tomorrow night, Rob Doster with the Miller brothers. Sean and Arch on tomorrow night. <laughs> Hopefully a much better slate. And maybe I'll even uh, I'll call in on my way back from Seton Hall, Providence. We'll see. Have a good <laughs>